My Father, we just bow before you tonight, and Lord, we come with your infallible word before us. And Father, we just pray tonight, O oh God, that you will come and that you will bring authority and power upon your word. And Father, we just pray tonight for those that are in our meeting that aren't saved. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord, O oh God, that you will draw them to yourself. Lord, we can't save them. We can't stir them up, Lord. We can't uh, do anything, Lord. And Father, we just ask tonight, O oh God, that this is your work. And Father, we just ask you to do everything tonight in this meeting. Father, I just come before you just now as a blood-bought child of yours. And Father, I just come and I ask once again for a fresh filling of the Holy Ghost. And Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that no man would see me as while I stand up here tonight, save Jesus only. And Father, we just come tonight. And Lord, we uh, desire your presence, Lord, above everything tonight. We desire the presence of God. Lord, that's what we long for, to come amongst our meetings once again like never before. We long for the unadulterated presence, not watered down, just the pure, raw presence of God like Moses experienced on the Mount of Old. So, Father, we just come to you tonight. And, Lord, we just ask for your help. And, Lord, we just ask for you to undertake in everything in this meeting. For we ask it in the lovely name of your Son. Amen. Amen. Just turn over to uh, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 for a, a small reading tonight. Mark chapter 10 and verse 46. Mark chapter 10 and verse 46, six, and it says these words, And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the wayside, begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him, charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called, him, called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good cheer, be of good comfort, rise. He calleth for thee, and he cast away his garment, rose up, and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. And that will end our reading for tonight. Jesus, as he was going from right up to Jerusalem on his last path to be crucified, and on, as we call, Palm Sunday to enter Jerusalem on the back of a colt, he made his way across the Jordan River and as he made his way across the Jordan River with his disciples following him at his at, on his tail, he came into this city of Jericho, the first city you will remember that the children of Israel took whenever they possessed the promise, went to possess the promised land, the city of Jericho. And as they walked through, I'm sure the Lord Jesus walked through the streets of Jericho while he entered. And this great number of people followed him. And I was thinking earlier on of how the Lord must have looked over that congregation of men. And he would have seen the old critics there. And then he would have seen the old religious Pharisees. And then he would have seen those that on, didn't believe in him. And I'm sure as he looked on to Calvary, as he knew where he was going, he could see maybe even some in the crowd that in a few days would cry, crucify him. Crucify him. And yet, here were men and women that thronged him walking the streets of Jericho. And as this procession walked through the streets of Jericho, 
heading for Jerusalem, weaving their way through the streets. They finally come to the gate that leads to the highway heading out to Jer Jerusalem. They come to the highway heading on to Jerusalem, heading out of Jericho. And here we find and here we bump into this man by the name of Blind Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, Blind Bartimaeus. In Matthew's account, it tells us that there was two beggars. There was two men. But here in Mark's account, he just mentions the one Bartimaeus. And I wonder, could you just imagine it just for a little moment? These two men, maybe getting up like any other morning, got their begging garments on them. And as they groped for the walls round the wall streets of Jericho and intended to go to the same place that they'd always went to beg, and they keep on thumbing their way round and crawling their way round, the blind leading the blind. And I just want to say just for a moment in passing to dear believers in here tonight, I want to throw out a warning call just when I pass here that there's men and women and we have sounded it night and night, night after night from this pulpit that there's men and women and they've got the clerical robes and they've got the congregation and they've got the church. And friends, the nicest thing that I can say about them is they're blind leaders of the blind. They're groping their way along. They're telling men that they can get to heaven by being a good person. They're telling men and women to just keep on doing what they're doing. Keep on now. Keep coming to your church. Keep paying your tithe. And friends, they're blind leaders of the blind. And here we have these two men as they make their way around the streets. And maybe one of them over here hears a conversation. I'm only supposing now. Don't, uh, I'm only supposing. One of them over here is a conversation on the street corner that Jesus of Nazareth has came to Jericho. And these men, what they do is they wriggle their way around the walls, groping the streets. Hugging, the, the, hugging from one door to the next, trying to get into the crowd, and they can't do it. They're too slow. They're too far behind. So what they do is they think ahead. They plan ahead. They plan ahead, and what they do is they go to the highway that leads down to Jerusalem. They, lead, they, they get there, and they, there they sit, and there they get ready to beg. And here we have this man, blind Bartimaeus. I want to just single him out tonight. Not no sight. I wonder, have you ever thought what it's like to have no sight? What it's like to have no eyes, not to be able to see the beautiful day, not to see your friends, not to be able to read, not to be able to drive, to have no sight. And here blind Bartimaeus is sitting on the highway leading out of Jer Jericho, heading to Jerusalem. And what he hears now that he's so sensitive to uh, to hearing and to touch. He hears the muffles of the crowd that are coming out to the gate. And he hears the tramp of the feet along the, the sandy, dusty road. And before long, all of a sudden, the crowd is just where he is sitting. Just where he is positioned on the highway leading to Jerusalem. The crowd just suddenly can't come up to his position. And what does old blind Bartimaeus do? Well, he takes the opportunity that he has. He takes the only opportunity this man has ever had and he cries out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And I ask you the question, dear unbeliever in this meeting tonight, how many opportunities have you had? How many good gospel meetings have you been in? How many gospel tracts have you been handed time after time? And here was a man that only had one opportunity and he cries out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the old crowd, what they do is they tell him to keep quiet. They say, keep quiet. There's no need to shout. Jesus isn't interested in you. You're the last man that this man wants to see. Jesus doesn't want to see you. Keep quiet. Keep quiet. And on the third blind part of me is what he does. It says he cries a great deal the more. Cries the louder. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. I wonder if you can just think of it for a moment. The man just lying there. Nobody helping him. He just cries, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Thou son of David, 
have mercy on me. Time and time and time again. And when he was saying that phrase, what he really meant was, I believe that you're the chosen one. I believe that you're the Messiah. I believe. I believe. And time and time again he cried out. And the old crowd tried to hinder him and stop him and blar him and block him. But to no avail, this man knew what he wanted. This man knew what he wanted. And what happened was that, as we just read, those lovely little, that lovely little phrase in verse 49, and Jesus stood still. Jesus stood still. God incarnate, the Son of God, God the Son, stopped on his track as he was going to Calvary. He stopped. He stopped that day and stood still. And maybe here, once again, you've been coming night in and night out. And you know what's the right thing to do is to get saved. You know that in your heart tonight. You know and you're convicted and God has been speaking to you through the messages that you've heard for two weeks. And maybe even from your own place. I don't know. Wherever you go, I don't care. But God has been speaking. I have no doubt of that. And then maybe you go home and you tell the wife or you tell the, the husband and you say, Oh, I'm thinking about getting saved. I know I need to get right. I know those men are telling the truth. And like the old crowd, they say, keep quiet. You don't need that old nonsense. It's only an old notion that you have. You're only feeling sorry for yourself. It's, uh, uh, that's, not, that's not for you. Maybe that's what the devil has been telling you in during the week. That's not for you. That's not for you. That's for all those religious men. That's for those men that wear the shirt and the tie. That's for them that carry the big Bible. That's not for you. Keep quiet. It's only an old thing in your head. But friend, I, I plead with you tonight, you keep crying the more. You go on in spite of hell and the devil. No matter who tries to hinder you, go. You go. You go no matter who it is in your family, no matter what price it'll be, no matter what cost it'll be, no matter what reputation you'll get, go. Go. You see, man, this man cried out the more. And then Jesus stood still. I was thinking of that. What a solemn thing it is for God to stand still. To stand still over a heart that has been crying with no mercy, no respect of men. Men maybe mocked him as he walked the streets, blind, didn't know where he was going, coaxed him, maybe made fun of him and belittled him, tapped him on the shoulder and run away. I don't know. But here was a man who cried out in sincerity, with reality, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still. And friend, I say to you tonight in this meeting, if you're a sinner and you come with an old half-hearted thing and you say, now I want to get saved. I want the lost the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart to have a nice little rosy life. I want to get right with God just to say that I'm a member of a church. Friend, you'll never get saved. It has to be real. It has to be real. This man cried out with reality. Son of David, have mercy on me. You see, Bartimaeus, what his name means, the first word, part of it, bar there, it means son of. And then Bartimaeus, it means uncleanness. It means defile. It means to be polluted. And what a name this man carried around with him day in, day out, on top of his infirmity of being blind, being called defiled being called unclean, being called polluted, uh, people mocking him because of his name, people mocking him because of his situation. And I say to you tonight, if you're here and you're sort of a wee bit gentry of yourself or you think you've got a bit of blue blood on you, you think you're an aristocrat, I tell you, the friends, tonight that you carry the exact same name as blind Bartimaeus. We are all born and shapen in sin. We're all sinners by nature. None are as any better. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. We're defiled inwardly. We're unclean outwardly. You see, as we said it the other night, it's in your DNA. It's in your genes. You can't cut it out. You can't wash it out. You can't burn it out. You can't work it out. It's only the blood of Christ can blot it out. It's only the blood of Lord Jesus Christ can take it away. 
Nothing else. Nothing else. You see, he had inherited this name from his parents. And dear sinner, as you sit in this meeting tonight, you have inherited your sin from your parents. Right from Adam. You have inherited every single bit in your genes as came right down the line. It's inherited. And you see, that's the root of sin. Like we said the other night, the bird is the nature to fly. The fish is the nature to swim. That's the nature. But then that little root, it blossoms up. And what happens? Their fruit comes out of it. Like the rose in a garden. Fruit, fruit comes out. And here's some of the fruits that I want to mention to you tonight. Lies. Stealing. Murder. Oh, well, now I don't murder anyone. But do you hate anyone? Well, now I don't steal anything. Do you envy anything? Anyone's belongings? And drunkenness. Where are you going to be tomorrow night, sir? Where are you going to be drinking at tomorrow night with the friends? Blasphemy. Taking the Lord's name in vain. Homosexuality. Adultery. If you're here and you're fiddling with another man's wife, if you're here and you're fiddling with another woman's husband, that's sin. It's adultery. And God hates it. You see, it's not necessarily what we do. It's what we are. We're sinners by nature. Man, if you never did any of these things, you'd still go to hell because you were worthy of it. Because we're sinners by nature. We're sinners in our very being. Defiled. Unclean. Polluted. Blind Bartimaeus. And yet this man who was defiled Blind, polluted. Whenever he cried out in sincerity, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still. Je Jesus stood still. And cast your eye on down there to verse 49. And Jesus stood still and commanded. Man, that hit me today. And commanded him to be called. He didn't invite him. And I have to apologize if I've ever preached and probably have and say, no, you come if you want. You come if you think you need to. God doesn't say that. God says you have to. God says you have to come. God commanded him to come. But in the time of ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere what? To repent. Man, God is getting, he's tightening the rope. He's telling us to repent. Imagine if you were out in the fire there. And you were a fireman and there's a house ablaze. And there's a young man, young, young person, I don't know what, whoever he was, was trapped in an upstairs room. And the flames are going up and the flames are flying and the smoke and the house is going up. And you climb up those stairs and you know there's only moments to go. And you see the young man huddled in the corner of his bedroom, in the cupboard, ran out of the road and the smoke and the flames is coming around him. Do you think that fireman would say, now come if you want to? Do you think that fireman would say, now you just come if you think it's the right decision to make? That fireman would cry, come, come to me, young man. And so does the Lord cry to you night in, night out, dear on saved in this meeting, night in, night out, man, these men have been preaching the word, come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, come. Christ commanded them. Christ told them to come. And what he did, remember when there we read it, whenever Christ commanded them to become the old crowd, what they did, they changed their tone. Well, now they said, be of good comfort. He calleth for thee, arise, get up. Be it's all right, Bartimaeus. He wants you now, come on. And before they were telling him to keep quiet, and I tell you tonight, friend, if your friends are hindering you from salvation, if your friends and your family are hindering you, they're fickle, they'll change like the leaf in the wind, they'll blow about. But God Almighty still says, come, come on to me. God commanded him to come. Don't follow the crowd tonight. If you're afraid of getting saved because of the crowd, because of the fear of man, it's the fear of man that brings a snare. It's the fear of man. We heard the other night when Bertie talked about the, those in the top of the list, list were the fearful and unbelieving. Are you afraid tonight to get saved because you don't want to tell your wife? Are you afraid tonight to go home because you can't tell you what are the work friends going to say? What are they going to say? Man, let them say what they want. 
get saved and get right with God. Forget about the, forget about the crowd. And what did he do? What do you think old blind Bartimaeus did? Did you say, do you think he said now, oh, I'm not going to go. I was only testing him. No, my friends, there's three steps that blind Bartimaeus made and I, I lay them out to you tonight, the three steps of a sinner to get saved. There's three things that blind Bartimaeus did. First of all, he cast off his garment. He cast off his garment. Verse 50, and he cast away his garment. Now, what, what it was, was this garment was given to professional beggars. They were really licensed to be a beggar now that he had this garment. The only beggars had it. It was distinct from every other bit of clothing that men had. It was distinct from everything else. An old blind Bartimaeus would have wore this day in, day out. It was nearly a part of him. It was nearly a part of him. And whenever the, invit, the command come to get up and arise, what he did was he cast it away. He cast it off. He cast it away. And if you're ever to come to Christ tonight, unbeliever, sinner tonight, unrepentant in your sin, you're going to have to cast a few things off. There's no point getting saved and living like the devil. And maybe you're here and you possess to be saved and you live any old way. You live whatever way you want. Oh, no, I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. I can do what you want. Not a bit of you. Not a bit of it. There's things to put away. The garment of sin. The garment of the pleasure of the world. The garment of pleasure. The garment of sin. The garment of the world. Oh, well, maybe there's someone in the say, I want my sin. I love my sin. I love my lust. I love my drink. I love my drugs. I'm going to keep it. Well, you can you can keep whatever you want, but you can't of God. You can't of God. You see, friends, if we really got a grip tonight, if we really knew what sin will do to a man, if we could really see men and women that are lamenting in the chasms of hell tonight because they held on to sin, if we could see men and women tonight weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth for all eternity over sin that they refuse to let go of, over sin that they refuse to give up, loving their sin more than Christ. You see, friends, your sin will take you to hell. And I am not up here, and we are not up here night after night in the business, and we don't have a sign up on the gate that Jesus Christ is for sale. He's not. Christ is not for sale. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And my friend, as Johnny said it, what the other night, it's his way or no way. It's his terms or no terms. We can't bargain with Christ. We can't come to him and say, I'm going to get saved and live like we want. And if you're here tonight and you're a believer and you are living like that, you need to really question it. If you're not concerned about sin in your life, if you're willfully, habitually sinning, continually day in, day out, and you know what you need to question. It's big, big stuff. The man, this man, now he was blind, but he had a bit of common sense in him. He had a little bit of common sense in his mind that day. Whenever he rose, whenever he called, when Jesus called him, he knew that there were things that he would never need again. He knew from that moment, that day, that hour, that he was finished with that old beggar's garment. And friend, I tell you tonight, if you come to Christ, if you come and get saved and get genuinely born again of the Spirit of God, there's things in your life that you're going to have to be finished with. There's things in your life that you're going to have to put an end to. There's things in your life we're going to have to get rid of. You see, here tonight, do you hate sin? Do you hate sin? And I ask you the question tonight, if I could take you down to Alton and Calvin, down to the city hospital there and bring you into the cancer ward, and do you think if you asked a man that was dying, do you think that he would say, I love cancer? Not a bit of him. And cancer's riddling his, riddling his body and he's taking, he's going to, it's going to kill him someday. And yet you hold on to the very thing that's going to damn your soul. You hold on to it like you've never held on, on to anything before and you say, I want this. Oh, I tell you, friends, sin is... Serious, serious business when it comes to God. I remember listening to A.W. Tozer one night 
on a tape and he told the story of a half-wit that was in a meeting. Johnny and a few of you maybe know it. And this half-wit was in the meeting. He just, he wasn't all there. And what happened was he used to go around and ask questions after the meeting. And what happened was this businessman came into the meeting that didn't want to be there. He just came to please his wife, just came to, cl- to please the family. And this man got up after the meeting after Tozer had preached the gospel message. And he walked down to the businessman, this big man that had the big home and the big cars. And he asked him, sir, do you want to go to heaven? And the old businessman, ardent as he was, he said, no, I don't want to go there. And the wee man turned around to him and I liked his answer. He said, then go to hell. Go to hell. And I say with that love to you in my heart tonight, oh, you dear sinner, if you want to keep your sin, God says you can, but there's a price to pay. There's a price to pay. There's a price to pay for keeping your sin. You see, not only did he cast it away, not only did he cast his old defiled garment away, what he did was he, he renounced it. He says, I don't need that old garment anymore. I don't need the old sin anymore. I don't need the nightclubs. I don't need the drink. I don't need the drunk, the drugs. I don't need the adultery. I don't need the homosexual, homosexuality anymore. And what he did was he cast it off. But what he did then was he rose up. He rose up. And I asked again the believer in this meeting, are you in a life cycle of confession, sin, confession, sin, round and round and round you go? You see, this man knew that whenever he, he confessed his sin, he had to flee from it. He repented of it. There's no point you coming and saying, Lord, I'm sorry for my adultery, I'm sorry for my sin, and living like a devil the rest of your life. There's no point. It's turning from your sin. It's walking away from your sin. It's saying, I'm finished with this. This man, what he did was he cast off his garment and then he rose up. If you were to drive down the street in Dungannon and you were to take the wing mower off a car, would you, and you'd have a bit of decency in you to go and apologize to that man and say, I'm so sorry for taking the wing mower off your car. I didn't mean to. And then a few days later, he has it back on again. You go and you hit it off again. And then you go again and you say, oh, I'm sorry for doing that again. And then he's it on another time. And then you hit it off again. And you keep doing this for a few days. How do you think that man would feel? And yet, God Almighty, we think that he, we can just come to him, confess and sin, confess and keep going round and round and round and round. I'm talking about willful, habitual sin now. You see, this man, what he did was he cast the garment off. Then he rose up. And after he rose up and turned from his sin, what did he do? He came to Christ. He came to Jesus. And came to Jesus. That's the word. It's sin or the Savior. Can I say that again? Young man, it's your sin or the Savior. Young woman, it's either your sin or the Savior. It's one or the other. You can do whatever you want. Sin or the Savior. The Lord said those lovely words in Romans 2 are come out from among them. Be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them. Come out. And maybe you're here and you're living, uh, you're a believer and you're dibbling and dabbling in things of the world and God says, come out, man. Come out from the old filth of the world. Come out with the old, without, well, come away from the old dirt of the world. Come out and be clean. Come out. Come out from among them. Touch not the young th- clean thing. You see, we would rather see one young man, young one young woman in these gospel meetings that come out for God all out and all out ablaze for God than 30 men that nod their head and put their hand up in a meeting. We would rather have one man that's real with God than 30 false fires. We want men and women that are born again and know it. And know it. Cast it away, man. Rise up. And then come to Christ. Come to Christ as you are, but leave your sins where it is. Don't bring your baggage with you. Leave it. Come to Him. He said, old things will pass away. Behold, all things will become new. Come to Christ. Come to Him. Oh, friends, please. You see, whenever Jesus said these words, what wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? What do you want me to do? 
What do you want me to do, Bartimaeus? What do you want me to do for you? You see, Bar this man had a few options. Because he was a beggar, he could have said, no, well, I really, I want bread. Or I, I need a new, a new, new garment. Or I would like to, I would like to go, go here. I would like you to help me. I can, I can do this here. Give me a hand. Give me, give me money. But blind Bartimaeus, what he does, he doesn't butter it up. He goes to the root of the problem. He knows what his problem is. He says, I need to receive my sight. I need to look, I need to see again. He didn't cover it over. You see, you gotta give blind Bartimaeus a robe. You gotta give him the best robe in the land. You could give him a king's throne. You could have given him a best walking stick in the land. You could give him men to help him. But this man would still have been blind. He would still have been blind. And friends, you can go to your church. You can do your good works. You can be a good person. You can do all the nice things. But you're still a sinner in the sight of God. You're still only a sinner. Oh, friends, you're only a sinner no matter what you do. You see, if you got a leper there and you put a new garment on him, a brand new linen garment, he would look just like any other man for an hour or two or a day or two even until the old pus of the, the sores would start to seep through the garment. And before long, the new garment would just be as bad as the old one would. You see, it eventually comes out. The old eventually comes out in her nature. You can paint the wheel of a car with the dirt on it, but it'll still come out. The sin nature will still come out. You see, it's by faith alone, in Christ alone, not by works, not by being a good person, not by being a religious person, not by adding to it, not by doing anything to it, just by coming to the foot of the cross by a, a hell-deserving sinner and saying, Lord, I know that I'm not right with you. I know if you were to come back tonight, I would be in a lost eternity. I know that I would miss it. And I come to you and acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I turn from my sin and I ask you to save me. I asked you into my heart because I know that you're the only one that can. And old blind Bartimaeus, whenever he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight, praise God, he said, says, immediately he received his sight. Immediately. Just at that very moment. Just at that very split second. Not a whole, he didn't have to tick a box. He didn't have to read a, a book. He just cried out and immediately, that very second. And friends, if you cry out to Christ, immediately at that very second you cried in earnestness, God Almighty will save you. You see, blind Bartimaeus, he was blind. And so are you. So are you. It says in the Word of God that the devil has blinded the minds of them that believe not. He's blinded your mind by sin. Blinded your mind to the judgment for sin. And then he's blinded your mind to the only one that can deliver you from sin. The one that died on Calvary's cross is the only one that can atone for sin. The one that hung there. The one that hung there stripped naked, despised and rejected the Son of God. He died for you. He died for you. He died because of you. So that he could save you. The Son of God the one that sustains all things by the word of his power, the one that created the heavens and the earth as he hung there, stripped, regal, he, stung, he hung there, suspended between heaven and earth for you and for me because nothing else could do. Friends, if we could work our way to heaven, do you think that he would have died? Do you think if there was no such thing as heaven or hell that Jesus Christ would have hung on that cross for you and for me? Not a bit of him. He came because it was the only way. He was the only way that could atone for sin. You see, blind Bartimaeus, whenever he heard the words, Come. Sinner, I'm pleading with you tonight from the heart of God. Come. 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 What he did was he cast off the old garment. He rose up and he came. He came to Christ. He came to him. And he said these lovely words, Thou son of David. Have mercy on me. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. The only one friend that can show you mercy and compassion that's in this meeting at this very moment is the Son of God. The only one that can show you mercy from your sin is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's coming a day when mercy will stop forever. 
There's coming a day when mercy will stop with the judgment day of Christ when every sin, every deed done in the body will have to be accounted for. And Jesus Christ is the only one that Bartimaeus who hit it nail in the head can show you mercy. Mercy. For God, what? So loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, the arms that were nailed to those at the cross, the hands that were nailed to that Roman gibbet, they were outstretched in mercy on that day. And here tonight and every other night they have been outstretched once again in mercy. Outstretched to you to come to Him. He commands all men everywhere to repent. You see, if you had a just judge, and there was a man that was worthy of a crime of death. Maybe he had murdered. I don't know what he'd done. And he's brought before the judge. And the judge says, Now, well, I'll pardon you because you, you're a nice man and we know that you, you're a good person. You see, that judge isn't just. That sin hasn't been punished. But God Almighty in that day, whenever he stands and looks at you in your own, as you stand there, as he's in that great white throne judgment seat, and you stand there defiled, filthy, sin riddling you, just as you stand there with all the deeds done in the body, he can't let you go. He can't pardon you. No, there's no other way but for sin at home. Only the blood of Christ. You see, if we go the way we are at this very moment, we will bear the wrath of God on our own. We will bear every brunt of the wrath of God on our own. And that's why Christ died on the cross. Because on, the thir on that day, not only did he suffer the punishment of men, but on the th uh, in those hours of darkness, those three hours of darkness, he pun the punishment and the wrath of God was upon him. He bore every bit of wrath, every bit of punishment on that cross for you and for me. You see, blind Bartimaeus was sitting on the highway of God, the highway to Jerusalem that day. Blind Bartimaeus was sitting begging at the side of the road. And that day he was on the highway and God met with him. And as you sit in this meeting tonight, you're on the highway because God Almighty's here. God Almighty's here and he's saying to you, you're a sinner and you know it. You're not right with me and you know it. And if I come back tonight, you'll be in hell. And you sit on in the highway of God, twiddling your thumbs and nodding your head. And God commands you to come. Come, man. Come to Christ. Christ died for you. Christ died for you. Christ then, what he did on the third day, he rose for you. And then Christ calls for you night after night. And there's nothing else after that that he can do for you. He's done absolutely everything that he can. He gave himself as an offering for your sin. He hung there for you, man. He hung there for you so that you wouldn't go to a lost eternity. And he's asking you tonight, like, boy, Bartabias, come. Command him to come. Come on to me. Come, man. It's time to get right with God. You've sat in day in, day out, and you're getting harder every night. You're getting harder, and you're coming. You say, oh, that's not for me. I'll do it another night. I'll put it off to some other time. And God says, now. It's now. It's now. It's time to get right with me now. Now. You see, the solemn thing about it was blind Bartimaeus. It was his last chance. If blind Bartimaeus had missed him on that highway, he would never have seen him again. He would never meet Christ again. He would never see him again or hear of him again. That was the last time that he was going through Jericho to go, to, to go up to Calvary there to die for sin. Never to come this way again. And the solemn thing about it is it could be the same for you tonight. It could be the same as you sit in this meeting in the highway of God and you couldn't miss it. You could miss it. Jesus is passing this way. Passing this way today. I plead with you, dear sinner, get right with God. Get right with Him. Ere He comes and you stand there on your own before God Almighty in that day and you shake your fist at Him time and time and time again. And he opens the chasms of hell and you're dropped in. Oh, come on now. Command Him to come. And Jesus stood still. 
And Jesus stood still. He was looking to know what he was going to do. He was waiting for a response. And Jesus tonight is standing still over your heart. Standing still right beside you. He says in Philippians that God is at thy, thy hand. God is at your elbow. God is at your elbow. And he stood still. Stood still. I am come that ye may have life and that ye may have it more abundant. No other way. Buddha can't do it. The Pope can't do it. Religion can't do it. The drug sir will never do it. The drink and the good nights will never do it. I am come that ye may have life and that ye may have it more abundantly. It's up to you now. It's up to you to do what old blind Bartimaeus did on that day. He rose up and he came. We can't twist your arm up your back. We can't tell you what to do. We can't force you into some wee decision. But he came willingly and so must you. So must you. Or else you will meet him as judge of all creation. And you will stand before him on your own. And the books will be open. And every single deed done in the body will be read out before you. And as we said the other night, you'll be cast into the lake of fire. And that's why the Lord said, come. 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 Let us pray. Now, Father, we just lay everything before you, Lord. And we bring those before you that aren't saved. And, Father, we just pray that you'll speak on into their hearts for those that are cold in heart and once walked well with thee. Father, we just pray in Jesus' name that you will come down. And, oh, God, that you will draw them to yourself like blind Bartimaeus, that old man that was blind in his sight. Father, we just pray in Jesus' name as he did on that day that he rose up and shook off the old filth and the dirt of the world and he came. Father, we just pray tonight, O oh God, that men and women will flee from the wrath to come to Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, we just lay it before you in the lovely name of your Son. Amen.